I just want to start by taking a moment to say thank you for being a church that worships so well. Man, I I get to sit up front here and I think everybody should have the opportunity to sit up front so you can just hear all these voices singing at you. I would encourage you, next Sunday, fight for the front row. It's pretty cool. It really is. And if you enjoyed the worship, just a little commercial here. This Thursday, we are having our next worship night at 630. So it's just a continuation of worship. If you're here today and you're like, that was a great worship, but I don't want to hear the preaching. I'm sorry you're about to hear some preaching. But if you come back Thursday, you can hear some great worship, maybe a quick testimony and stuff. So take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, Jeremiah chapter 29, I'm going to get there in a few minutes, but I'd like it if you're just ready for us to look at that. So whether you're using a device or your Bible, just mark Jeremiah chapter 29 and we'll get there in just a couple minutes. When Barack Obama was running for president, tennis player Serena Williams told reporters that she was excited about Barack Obama's presidential candidacy. However, she won't vote for him because she is a Jehovah's Witness. And Jehovah's Witnesses don't get involved in politics. Her sister, Venus, who is also Jehovah's Witness, wouldn't even comment on the upcoming presidential election. So why don't Jehovah's Witnesses vote? Like, what's the reason for that? It has to do with their misinterpretation of John 17, 14, and other passages in the Bible. Um, But in John 17, 14, Jesus says of his followers that they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So Jesus says that about his followers. So Jehovah's Witnesses have interpreted that statement as a call to refrain from involvement in politics. But that's not what Jesus intended. What he was saying is that because of the new birth Believers now have a citizenship in heaven. That if you've given your life to Christ, you now, have a, you now have a home in heaven. Jehovah's Witnesses are described as representatives of God's heavenly kingdom, and they are obligated to stay out of local politics in keeping with the behavior of ambassadors. In addition to not voting, Jehovah's Witnesses also refrain from serving in the military, running for public office, and pledging allegiance to the flag. So are the Jehovah's Witnesses correct? As a church, is that how we should view politics? We're in this series called Elephant in the Room. We're in week number two now where we're going to talk about politics at church a little bit. And did Jehovah's Witnesses have it right? Like, would it be easier just to take that approach? I have found that it is actually very easy to not talk about, to t- not talk about politics at church. I can come here on Sunday morning and blend in and never have to talk about politics with anybody and we could just avoid it. Is that the best option as a church? I believe, though, the church should be the safest place in the world to talk about anything without the fear that the person sitting next to you each week is going to turn on you because you're asking questions or because you vote differently. So let me say this. If you're looking for a church where everyone is the same, you're not going to find it here. We're not all going to look the same, vote the same, act the same. And I'm thankful for that because all of us tend to get comfortable with our life with our beliefs, with our convictions, with our politics. And if we don't ever stop and reconsider or to hold up our beliefs and compare it to the Word of God and what the Word of God is teaching, then of course I'm going to get off track. We need to be challenged and we desperately need to learn to love our neighbors more than our politics. Man, as we head into the final months of this campaign season, it's really going to start ramping up. The candidates, they're going to debate terrorism, War, rising fuel cost, the economy, health care, global warming, social issues, gay marriage, abortion, immigration, education, and so many other important issues that have already created sharp divides and division. Here's what I think we need to know. Jesus is political, but not partisan. Jesus is political, but not partisan. He's not a Democrat or Republican. He's not American either, by the way. He's not going to vote this election season. He doesn't fit nicely into either party. When we try to cram Jesus into our Republican or into our Democrat boxes, it just doesn't work. But at the same time, Jesus is political, 
he doesn't stay silent about politics. And to understand that idea, uh, we need to understand what politics means. And often, we think politics just means like government. But it is so much bigger than that. Politics is the beliefs, opinions, and actions concerned with the ordering of society. Our word politics, it comes from the Greek. It's a Greek word polis, and it just means city. So it's about the city. It's about society. It's about communities. It's about questions of how we are going to live together in public, how you and I are going to live together, how the people in this room are going to live and do life together. And government is a piece of that, but politics is much more than that. If you can understand this idea of politics, then when you read the Bible, it becomes obvious very quickly that Jesus cares a lot about politics. How do I know? Well, he has a lot to say about public life, about society, about how we treat one another. When he opens up the Isaiah scroll in the synagogue in the beginning of his ministry, he reads a passage about the freeing of captives and good news for the poor. He cares about these things. Our question, though, is this. What does Jesus have to say to us right here in our moment politically? So that's what we're going to do. Let's start with that. What is our moment politically? What is it? Well, this is an election year. You probably heard. And surprise, it's the rematch that all of us wanted, right? We got Donald Trump and we got Joe Biden. And, but I want to ask you a broader question. How do you think politics in America is going? How are we doing? I, I read a survey this week, and it was from Pew Research Center, and they took the survey in 2023. Um, it asked 8,000 Americans that same question. How do you think politics in the, in the U.S. is going right now? They asked them to give them one word or phrase. They found that 79% of people said something negative about politics. 10% said something neutral. 9% refused to answer the question. And just 2% of people had something positive to say about politics. And I think those 2% of people must have moved here from another country with a dictator or something. But they actually did a word cloud of their responses. And if you know what a word cloud is, it's whichever words were used more gets bigger, the ones that get used less or smaller on the document. And here's some of the responses that showed up on that word cloud the most. Divisive, corrupt, chaos, messy, dysfunctional, a bunch of other things that are kind of funny like joke, circus, and then a bunch of things that I can't say in church, a lot of those. Just one positive word was said enough to even make the word cloud. That word was good. How's politics going? Good. Slightly more people than that, though, said dumpster fire. We had more people describing our politics as a dumpster fire than good. So that's how we're doing. That's where we're at. So this is what most people think of politics. And it would be one thing if we were just outside observers to this, right? Like if we were just looking at this from afar and saying, yeah, you guys need to get it together over there. But it's not. We're not outside observers. This affects us personally. That same survey then went on to ask people, how do you feel when you think about politics? And this is what they found. 65% of people always or often feel exhausted. I think I can agree with that. Uh, 55% of some of the same people even often feel angry. Just 10% always or often feel hopeful. And just 4% always or often feel excited. Maybe you can resonate with that. I know I can. I mean, the last couple of election cycles, last 8, 10 years or so, I felt pretty exhausted at times. I was angry at times. I felt anxious at times, frustrated, concerned for the future. It just seems like things aren't working, like we just can't figure out how to live together. And to go a little bit deeper, here's why I think I personally am frustrated. So here's a little look in my mind. It's not just that I can't understand the values of a lot of other people in our country. Like, I get that. I understand there's other people out there with different values. I can't understand theirs, and maybe they can't understand my values. I get that. That's understandable. I know there's disagreement on some very important issues, issues that we as Christians shouldn't just lie down on either. But so much of my frustration is deeper than that because I often can't understand why even some of the people that I agree with are just so insane in the way they talk and think about politics. 
They don't seem to care who they offend. They don't seem to know where the line is. So I get frustrated because I don't want to associate with that behavior, but at the same time, I kind of agree with their position. Do you get that? Like, you probably experienced some of that, right? That behavior is, tends to be what frustrates me personally the most. And maybe you've had some of those experiences as well. That uncle who comes over for the holidays, that's always going to share his thoughts. Your relatives or coworkers who seem to get wrapped up in every Facebook conspiracy, conspiracy that gets posted. But what does God have to say about all this? So this morning, I want to start high level by saying this. I believe the lens through which we should view politics is the lens of exiles. The lens of exiles. Man, we just did a several-month series called Embracing Exile, where we worked through 1 Peter verse by verse. And Pastor Jason mentioned last week how in this series we're in now called Elephant in the Room, it's a continuation of our exile series. It's almost like this is how we put faith to our feet. This is how we go live out everything we learned about being in exile. This is how we practically live it out even in the middle of some pretty big elephant in the room type topics. So I believe Jesus wants you to see yourself as an exile. I do. I believe he wants you to live here. Your home is here. And if you're an American citizen, you have a duty here. But your primary identity, your citizenship is not here. You are a citizen of heaven. And that needs to impact how you see the politics of this world. You see, Jesus himself teaches us this in one of the most crucial moments of his earthly ministry. Towards the very end of his life, right before the crucifixion, he's already been kissed by Judas in the garden. He's already been betrayed. The soldiers have come and arrested him. He's been handed over to the Jewish leadership. They've bound his hands. They've beaten him. They put him on mock trial and have already decided that he's guilty and he's going to be put to death. The only problem is, is they don't legally have the right to put him to death. So they need the Romans to get involved for that to happen. So in the middle of the night, the Jewish leadership drag Jesus to the governor's mansion and they bang on the gate and they get somebody to come out. They say Pilate needs to interrogate this guy, Jesus. You see, the Jewish leaders wouldn't even go into Pilate's house because they didn't want to be defiled by being in the home of a Gentile. So they stay outside and they let Pilate take Jesus inside. What you need to know is that everything that happens with Pilate is a political conversation. The Jews told Pilate that Jesus is a threat to the empire, that he's claiming to be king even though everyone knows Caesar is king. And so Pilate wants to know whether that's true. The first question Pilate asked Jesus is this, are you the king of the Jews? It's a political question, right? Are you saying, Jesus, that you're in charge that you're the one who's going to decide how politics is going to work here? Is that what you're saying, Jesus? And what do you think Jesus says back? It's so classic. Like Jesus always responds. He changes the question entirely. He doesn't answer yes. He doesn't answer no. This is what he says in John 18, 38. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom, it's from another place. He's telling them, I have a kingdom, I am a king, make no mistake about that. I do care about politics. In fact, I not only care about society, I care about all of creation. However, my kingdom is not the type of kingdom you're thinking of. My kingdom is not of this world. Over and over again, we are reminded in scripture that we are a part of his kingdom. Your citizenship primarily is not here, and yet your home is here. And that's what makes you an exile. You live here, but you're not a citizen here. Like we've said so many times now, Peter writes an entire book, 1 Peter, to Christians who are living in exile. So by now, if you've been coming here, we should know that exile is an identity that the New Testament wants us to grasp. It's not something that God just made up. Uh, People following God for a long time have been exiled. It's also something we see a whole lot of in the Old Testament, and no place is more evident of that than when God's people were hauled into exile in a place called Babylon. You see, for the first time, God's people had to learn how to live as a people who honor God even when it seems like he's not in charge. For them, now it seems like Nebuchadnezzar is in charge. As we see ourselves as exiles, 
what can we learn from the experience of the exiles in Babylon? So I ask you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. We want to use this passage to help us keep that exile view. So we're going to read Jeremiah chapter 29 starting in verse 4. It says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. There's a couple of things that I really want to make sure we grasp from this passage. Two things that I believe Jeremiah is telling those exiles that we see from this passage that I want to start with. Number one, he's telling them we need to reject pride. Reject pride. Uh, let's talk about rejecting pride in their context for a minute. You have to understand that Jeremiah's message to the exiles was not the only message they were hearing. There were a lot of other people claiming to be prophets, claiming to speak on behalf of the Lord. In fact, a very specific false message they were hearing was this. Even though it looks like Babylon's winning, we need to resist. We need to fight. We need to pick up arms. Never give them an inch. And right around the corner, if we'll just keep fighting, God is going to smash Babylon and bring them to an end. We're going to be in power again. We're going to get the, bad, the good guys back on top. Everything's going to be fine as soon as God shows up and changes everything. That was one of the messages they were hearing. The exiles thought they knew what God wanted. But Jeremiah comes along and the message he gives to them was different. He's telling them that God allowed this to happen. He's saying, you're going to be in exile and believe it or not, Babylon, the place you now live in exile, is actually going to be pretty successful. So get used to it. Settle in. You're in this for the long haul. Build a house. Get married. Have some kids. He even goes further when he says to pray for the prosperity of Babylon, for the welfare of it. Because you live there now. If Babylon prospers, you're going to prosper. And if they don't, you won't. So he tells them, settle in. This is going to take a while. I think this message is good for us to hear as well. Because we also need to reject pride. It is so easy for us to think that we know what God wants. That we know the candidate he wants to win. Or that we know the policies he wants to implement. And I think most people who claim to know the will of God for our nation are much more like the false prophets than they are like Jeremiah. So please hear me well. I would love if America had 200 more years of prosperity and power and success. That would be awesome for me, for my kids, for my grandkids. I would love that. But I don't know that that's what God wants to do. He may want us to go through some hard things. Now trust me, I'm not rooting for that. I'm not wanting that to happen, but I do look at history and I look at the scriptures and I look at every, every other empire that has ever come into power and I know it doesn't usually end well. So church, we need to reject the pride of thinking that we know exactly what God is trying to do with these politics. We don't. It's pride when we try to say we do. So at the, we need to reject pride, but at the same time, he's also telling them to reject panic. It's almost like two, two gutters on both ends. So reject panic, secondly. You can probably imagine why it was so easy to fall into panic in that moment. I mean, the walls of Jerusalem had been torn down. The temple itself had been torn down. It's all gone now. The people have been hauled into Babylon. Now they're in exile at an evil, successful empire. Nebuchadnezzar was one of the most ruthless rulers who's ever lived. It would have been so easy for them to think that everything is over. It's done. It's horrible. That we should just hunker down, panic, and hide. But God doesn't say that to him. He says, no, you can still enjoy the goodness that I've created for you. Build a home. Build a family. Have some kids. Love the people I've brought into your life. Pray for your community, for your city. Work for their good. There's no need to panic right now. Just stay faithful. 
And I think that message goes for us today as well. It is tempting for us to panic, especially in an election year. For the next several months, you're going to hear all kinds of information, all kinds of opinions. You're going to see political ads. You're going to watch debates. You're going to see social media posts. And almost all of it is going to be designed to get you to panic, to get us to panic, to live in fear. You know, they've found out that fear is a really good motivator, that if people can get you to be fearful, they can control you. In politics, the goal is this, right? To get you to be so afraid of an outcome that you will vote for me, even though I'm flawed, even though I have all kinds of problems, but you better vote for me because you'll hate the other guy a whole lot more than you'll hate me. It's what fear is all about, right? And in the church, there's a particular brand of fear that I want to talk about just for a moment. So hang on. It's a fear that kind of goes like this. America was once a Christian nation where everyone loved God and honored him. Now, though, we no longer are. And the narrative is this. Things have been getting worse and worse and worse. And if we don't do something about it, and if we don't get the right person in office, we're going to lose it all. That's a narrative you're being told and that we're hearing. And there's this false understanding of the history of the church in America that leads to that. And I think it's important for us to talk about for a moment. You see, a lot of people think that the history of America is something like this. That when the settlers arrived from Europe, basically everybody was Christian. Like they got off the Mayflower, the Puritans were there, they held a prayer meeting, they built the church, and they started building a country, and everyone believed in Jesus and just kept living happily ever after. And then we believe that slowly, over the next few hundred years, things just got worse and worse and worse. And then the narrative goes, in the past 50 years, it's gotten really bad, like much worse. Now it would seem that very few people care about God, our country's not what it once was, And because of this, we think we need to figure out how we can restore what we've lost, right? The problem is, that's not true at all. This isn't our history. It's not. And church historians have dug into the history of faith in America, and particularly church attendance. Um, One of them named Rodney Stark, he's a religious author and professor. He shares it this way in his research. In the mid-1700s, somewhere between 10 and 17% of people went to church, 10 to 17%. But we wrongly think that everybody was a Puritan and that the founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence like at a Thursday night worship event. Like that's a narrative that for some reason we tend to buy into, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. There were Puritans and other persecuted religious minorities, there absolutely were. But there were also a lot of other reasons why people came to America. Some people wanted land. Uh, Some people wanted to get rich. Some people were criminals running from the law. Some people owed a bunch of money that they couldn't pay back and they came to escape that. So there's this very pluralistic society, even at the very beginning. And then what happens is actually a long period of slow growth. You see, there's the first great awakening in the early 1700s where many people come to faith and they committed their lives to the gospel. After that, The second great awakening happened in the late 1700s into the early 1800s. Then after that, you get the Civil War, and actually the fastest period of church growth in American history took place right after the Civil War for about 30 years. Finally, it peaked, and in 1960, nearly 60% of Americans attended some type of Christian religious service. Then, for about the last 60 years, there has been a slow decline to where we are at today, which is about 40% of us go to church. Started at about 10% in the 1700s. It is true that in our lifetimes, we've seen a slow decline in church attendance, but please don't buy into the lie that we need to panic right now because things are horrible and that there's some golden age we need to return to. Doesn't every generation idealize the past because they fear the future? I think that's exactly what happens. It's actually a pretty normal thing but we can't let that fear control us or get us to doubt the reality that God is still in control. We can still trust him. So if we're going to reject both pride and panic, what do we need to embrace? So we need to reject pride and panic. And I believe there's two things based on that passage that we need to embrace. So number three, we need to embrace your limitations. Embrace your limitations. Look at what Jeremiah says in verse number 10. 
He says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Notice who takes responsibility for what's going to happen. God does. He says, I'm going to be the one who will bring you back. God uses this language all over this chapter. In the beginning, he says, I handed you over to the Babylons. Yes, I did it. I sent you into exile, but I'm also the one who's going to bring you back. Later, he says, I'm also going to be the one who will hold Babylon to account eventually. God is reminding them he is in charge. He is in charge of the nations. He is the one who puts kings into place, and he is the one who removes them. Psalm 22 says it like this. The psalmist says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. How audacious of us to think that. Actually, God, we live in a democracy, so we rule our nation. You know, we decide who's in power and who's not. Now, trust me, I love democracy. I love our country. I promise I really do. But theologically, it doesn't change the fact that God is the one in charge of everything. You see, every knee will bow and will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And here's what's so great. He tells us the end of the story. He says, all the ends of the earth are going to turn to me. Every nation is going to bow down. That's the empire. That's the end. There is no empire. There is no nation that will be calling the shots. He will. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And when that's not happening, like it is right now not happening, when it's not happening in this moment, what we need to do is to lift our eyes up out of our circumstances and onto the promises of God because they're sure and they're true and they're solid. So we need to reject pride, reject panic, embrace your limitations, and then lastly, number four, embrace hope. Embrace hope. In this moment of darkness for God's people, when they were hauled into exile, when Babylon was in charge, we get one of the most hopeful verses in all of Scripture, one of the most fulfilling promises you'll ever read, and it's a favorite verse for many people, and it was written specifically to, those Babylon, to them in exile in Babylon. And here's what it says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. You might think that is hard to believe today. That things are so dark. That how could we really hold on to this? Now please don't forget who this was written to. That was written to them in that day. To the ones in exile in Babylon. But remember, those are people who saw their friends and family killed by the Babylons. They're the people who had to watch the temple be torn down, living under a vicious rule of an evil king. And to them, God says, take heart, don't panic, don't have fear. Remember, there's good and I've got hope and goodness in store for you. Church, that's also true of us today as well. That was written to them back then. But he has plans for us too. It's different than what his plans were for them, but he does have plans for us. The truth is still the same because Jesus tells us the same thing. He knows the plans he has for you. He knows the plans he has for your spouse, for your friends, for your family, for your children. He knows those plans and he is going to establish his kingdom for good once and for all. He's going to wipe away every tear. He's going to put an end to sin and evil and death His good plans are coming. We can count on them. But in this season of elections and politics, people are going to be freaking out everywhere. The temperature is going to continue to rise and increase. Anxiety and fear will be loud. It'll be everywhere around you, probably even louder than the 2020 election, if you can believe that. But church, we get a second chance at this. We do. What if this time we were known for something different? What if this time around we said, No matter what I read in the news, no matter what my friends and neighbors are saying, I'm just going to seek the Lord. And I'm going to remember that he is on the throne. In fact, I'm going to ask him for peace that transcends all understanding. I'm going to remember that there is a bigger story going on than just this little moment in time right now. Man, doesn't it seem like this moment is all about division? About figuring out who the enemy is? 
figuring out who the problematic people are who want the wrong things for our country, and then it seems like we must attack them personally. How messed up is that? The devil, our enemy, wants your family divided. He wants your community divided. He wants your church divided. He wants our country divided. And the reason, I think, the enemy wants you to panic, and the reason he wants you to get your heart and soul so tied up into the outcome of an election is because of this. You cannot make somebody the enemy in your life and be a witness to them at the same time. You can't do it. You have to decide what matters most. You can't make somebody your enemy and then also be a witness to them. It won't happen. Let me get real personal for a moment. Man, when we post and share things that divide and dismiss half of our country, whichever side you're on, when we do it in a brutish, obnoxious manner, we will never get back the opportunity to witness to the other side. We'll lose it. All because we've made them our enemy. How selfish and opposite of the gospel is that? I think we have some apologizing to do, primarily to God, because a lot of us, me included, have allowed this current moment to impact our witness. So should we be like the Jehovah's Witness? Just avoid politics altogether? I don't think so. Because Jesus didn't even do that. What we can do is purpose and decide who we are going to be regardless of outcomes. How will your neighbor know that a God they can't see really does love them when the church they can see doesn't really like them? You see, candidates win or lose based on our vote. But I believe the church wins or loses based on our response to the vote. Who are you going to be for the next few months? What are you going to be known for? The election this year is on November 5th. But what if right now you decided who you are going to be on November 6th? That right now you're committed to who you're going to be and what you're going to stand for. What if we were known for being people who just lived differently than the craziness around us? What if when everyone else is freaking out, when everyone else is yelling and arguing and pointing fingers, when everyone else is talking about how this is the most important moment of our lives, when everyone else is like that, what if it was clear that your peace was never hanging in the balance, that your peace is not going to be taken away? No matter who wins the election in 2024, you know who the king will be. He's never up for re-election. His reign has never been in doubt, and so your peace doesn't have to be in doubt either. What do you think God might do in our communities, in our families, in our workplaces, if that's how we tried to love during this election? I know I would love to see it, and I would love it if you would seek that with me this time around. You can have peace. You can have a steadfast assurance that God is in charge Will you pray with me for that? Will you pray that we will have that peace and that everyone here will keep a good witness over the next few months? Because it's important. We've got people to reach for the gospel and we don't want to lose our witness. So would you close your eyes and bow your heads just for a moment? I don't know what God's doing in your heart today. I don't know how he would even want you to respond to a message like this. But I do know that we can commit to what we're going to be right now, that we are not going to get drugged down into the weeds, we're not going to lose our testimony, we're not. We're going to commit right now to what matters most. And so I want to pray, and then as soon as I'm done praying, I would just invite you to stand, and if you need to pray with somebody, come down front, we'd love to pray with you. If you need to pray where you are, just respond however God would have you to do that. So let's pray right now. Father, thank you. Thank you for these Israelites who lived in exile for so long and this many years later we get to look back and read it and learn from it. And God, I pray that you'd help us to embrace the hope that you offer. I pray that no one is here living in fear that they don't know what's happening next and they're scared. God, I pray that today they could find your peace, that peace that doesn't make sense, that passes all understanding. Today, may they find that peace. God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you provide a way for us back to you in a place called heaven. And may we live with that in mind, knowing that heaven is our home. And it's in your son's holy name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me and as we sing, if you'd like to come forward, do that.